Good morning, MLC. Uh, welcome to our final week of Bible class this semester, this year. Uh, I am excited to uh, jump in and uh, hear what God has for us in this final lesson. Uh, but before we do, before we even jump in there, uh, let's open up in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, again, just be with this lesson as these MLCers are watching uh, our final Bible lesson. Why you, Father, allow trials? Why are trials, why do hard times come among us? And so I pray that you would help this to be, especially during this time, an encouragement to parents if they're watching, to siblings if they're watching, but especially my students, uh, Father, who may not quite understand, why, do I, why can't I go play at the park? Why can't I go do the normal things that I'm so used to in this life? And help them to seek a deeper relationship with you. Maybe one of them does not know you as the Messiah, the Savior. And we pray that they would make today, as they're watching this, the day of their salvation. We pray you'd bless them now, strengthen them, and be with this time in Jesus' name. Amen. And our final Bible lesson, Why God Allows Trials. Uh, let's open up the Bible books to page 135. Uh, we'll get into the Word of God here in a little bit. I want to get some introduction going. Uh, but why God allows trials. And again, that's page 135. If you're like, I'm still scrambling to find my Bible book, please pause the video. I'll say it one more time. Page 135. Now, uh, if you're done pausing the video, okay, uh, page 135, it says, these two words, and I really want you to understand them because when we read a certain book in the Bible, Job, which we're going to turn to here in a bit, um, it talks on these two words a lot. And one of those words is test or tribulation. Say that with me. Test or tribulation. And that simply is a trial that examines a person's inner qualities. A test or tribulation is a trial that examines a person's inner qualities. The inside, we've talked about it throughout the year, your inner character, who you really are, who God really cares you are. Yes, a reputation matters, but character is what's more important. We think of Saul, and Saul had a great reputation. He started out well, but the inside of his heart revealed he had bad character. And it was during a test or a tribulation of him being attacked by different people. Uh, the invading armies going against Israel, that he sat here instead of trusting in God. Well, he gave in to sin and did what he wasn't supposed to, doing things that actually a priest was supposed to do. And that's just one example. There's other examples in the Bible where people actually overcame it. We won't get to it this year, and I was really hoping we would, but that's the book of Daniel. And Daniel, so many times, even in the lion's den, and we talk about how he could have sat here and said, uh, I don't want to pray because I don't want the king to kill me. I don't want anything bad to happen to me. But here's the thing, young person. Daniel didn't do that. In fact, he passed with flying colors, and he trusted in God. And believe it or not, the lions that are so hungry shut their mouths and were so docile. They were so calm. They didn't want to even eat him. They didn't want nothing to do with him in terms of eating him. But that's God. Our second word is shun or eschew. Say that with me. Shun or eschew. Now that word simply means to stay away from, to avoid carefully. And if you really look up the definition, it goes a little bit further so much that I hate something. Right? So something that you should shun or eschew is disobedience. If you disobey your parents a lot, if you disobey uh, your family a lot, here's the issue. You should actually be staying away hating that thing, those things, the, the sin. We should hate it as Christians. And so shun or shu, again, means to stay away from or avoid carefully. And the reason I explain those is because those words are going to be used in what we read out of the book of Job. Now follow along with me on page 135 if you haven't already been. And it says, we have been learning about the importance of our personal character, surrendering our lives to the control 
of the Holy Spirit, letting God have his work in us. Not what I want to go do. Well, I would want to go play. I want to go uh, play video games. I want to sit here and read the books that I want to read instead of reading God's word. I want to sit here and do what I want to do when I want to do it with the wrong heart attitude. And we're really supposed to be in control of the Holy Spirit. If you're a Christian MLC, you guys ought to eschew evil and or hate evil or stay away from it and love the Lord. And standing for what is right, even if we stand alone. Now, we must learn more about the work of Satan, because even though we are Christians, Satan wants us to be happy in our lives and not to have faith in God. Sometimes we blame things on Satan that are really our own fault. I, I love, his name is Flip Wilson, and I learned this in Faith Bible Institute. And, and I actually looked him up, and I was like, okay, this makes a little bit more sense. Uh, Flip Wilson was a comedian way back when, and by no means, if you know who I'm talking about, am I advocating his comedy 100%, or at all, really. Uh, but what I am saying is he had a skit, and it would always be he would do something wrong, and then he would go, oh, the devil made me do it. The problem with that is you have a choice. If you were born again, you are not under bondage to sin. You don't have to sit here and do what is wrong. In fact, young person, when you disobey your parents, when you don't read the word of God, when you don't pray, when you don't watch the devotionals that are sent out, when you're not doing your schoolwork or you're cheating in it, you're really choosing sin. You're sitting in here saying to the Messiah that died for you, that you trusted him as your savior, you know what, Jesus, let me do my own thing, man. And that's exactly how you're talking to him, by the way. He's the God of heaven. He's the, he's the God of all creation. He's the God of salvation. And your thought is, eh, I'll do it my way, Jesus. I got this, man. You, you talk to him like he's your homeboy versus your God. Treating him as if he's just secondary versus the only thing. There are also times when God allows Satan to test us so that our character might be strengthened. There's times where he, bring, it, he tests us because he's like, you're doing wrong, and I'm going to allow this trial to bring you back to me. Sometimes it's to strengthen us. You know what's been so hard is, the, and I know I brought it up a couple times this year, is when I lost my dad now almost coming up this year two years. And it was tough. But you know what it did? It made me rely on my Heavenly Father a lot more. It's made me cherish my children a little bit more because life is but a vapor. It's actually strengthened me in my walk. During such times, we must remember that Satan cannot test a Christian unless God allows it. And you go, well, that's not very nice. No, it's to strengthen us. Let me, let me put it to you this way. You go, you, you seem to, you may think, well, that's mean of Jesus. That's not mean of Jesus. Think about it this way. Would you like, if I handed you a fake piece of gold, or we call that pyrite, fool's gold, or I handed you gold, which would you prefer? I would hope you're saying at home gold, because pyrite isn't really worth a whole lot. It's the same thing. God doesn't want just the, the fake stuff or the surface Christianity. He doesn't just want you to be saved, and that's good, and you got your fire insurance, and yes, you have a heavenly home. No, he wants you to excel in life, young person. God is still the divine controller of our lives. There's a reason that COVID-19 is going on. And regardless of what you stand for and you're like, I think it's a conspiracy. I think it's, uh, you know, we need to, we, we're going to all die or you're somewhere in between. It does not matter because God is in control. He's completely in control of this. He knew this from the foundation of the world. He's like, uh, you know, on, in March of 2020, I am going to go ahead and have a pandemic called, known as COVID-19, and I'm going to spread it all throughout the world. I'm going to allow it to happen, and Satan's going to have control over that. Why? How many more people have heard the gospel if you tuned into our live services at home, maybe at your church? Because the gospel has gotten to them. How many more people have now time to pray that are Christians to get into God's word? There is no excuse. 
Well, I've got other things to do at home. I love what Pastor Lehman preached on a while, a Sunday or so ago, and how he sat here and he preached and he preached with boldness as he ought to, and he preached on the idea that we need to be turning back to God. We always like to look at the different types of crowds, the liberals or the this group or that group, and say they need to turn to Jesus, or those people who go to the this school or do this thing, they need to turn to Jesus. You know, sometimes Christian, we need to turn back to Jesus. We need to make sure that He is priority in our lives. And no doubt, that may be part of why COVID-19 has happened. Now, I'm not saying I'm God. I'm not saying what the reason is. We'll find out in glory in heaven. But what I am saying is this young person is, it's a strengthening time. It's a repentance time. And that's why trials are allowed. This is what we learn from the story of Job. Now, you should have already done lesson 27. Um, but with that being said, as we start our lesson, first think about a time at which it would have been easy to blame someone, some sin on Satan. But it was really your own fault. Right? Think about a time where you did something wrong. I could, I can distinctly remember times before I was saved. Uh, and I can point out times after I asked Christ into my heart. But, you know, the biggest thing that I did, and, and one thing I always used to get on to, to, you know, blame God before I was saved was, I sat here and I'd get speeding tickets. And I was a teenager. I loved to race. And you know what? Every time I got the speed ticket, why did I get the speed ticket? It's not my fault. It's just, oh my word. It's just, why did the police officer pull me over? I'm so, or I'd be angry or, you know, whatever the case may be. But I'd be throwing my hands in the air, getting angry, blaming other people, blaming God, blaming all of that. And you know what was funny? Who put the pedal to the metal? It wasn't God. It was me. I brought that on. Or... There's been times where I blame Satan. Oh, you know, Satan made me look at that that I shouldn't have looked at or I, that music I should have listened to. No, it was a choice. And again, that's where I, I bring this up and I know it's been rehashed. Satan is an adversary. I've used devotional videos. You may have watched it where you need to be weary. You need to be sober. You need to be vigilant. But he's not always the reason that we fall. He's not always the reason we make mistakes. I'm not here to go and advocate for the guy because i he's my enemy. But I am saying sometimes it's our own choosing because we don't have to be under bondage. And so you should have had something. An example would be, you could write, you know, none of you have driven, but just as an example, uh, I have gotten a speeding ticket and I blamed God or Satan on that. Um, it is most important that we learn to take responsibility for our own actions and confess our sins to God when we are guilty of some wrongdoing. We must also realize that even when we do our best and live wisely, sometimes we have periods of trials or testing. This is what happened to a man named Job. I invite you this morning to open up your Bibles to the book of Job. We're only going to be here for a few short moments. Uh, I do want us to read... Um, just the first couple chapters, um, or actually just the first chapter today. Um, we're not going to read too much today, but enough to get a point across in that what was Job like? And we're not even going to necessarily read the whole chapter. I know I said that we would, because I want you to just get the idea of his character. We're not going to get into the temptation and all that if you're familiar with the book of Job, but I want you to see what kind of man Job really was. And so as we, fill, as we go through this chapter, um, I want you to, to answer some of these questions. So there was a man in the land of Uz in Job chapter 1. If you're not there, go ahead and pause the video. Job chapter 1. Okay, and if you, you hopefully by this point you've unpaused. Um, but Job chapter 1. There was a man in the land of Uz. His name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright. And one that feared God 
And that word eschewed, remember, that means despise, abstain from evil, meaning he wasn't going out and sinning and disobeying his parents. He wasn't sitting in here, you know, parting the life up. He wasn't playing wicked video games that have no business coming into our, our eyes or movies that are ungodly. No, no, no. He eschewed evil. There wasn't anything bad listed among him. And so it asks that first question, where did he live? In that first blank on page 135, he lived in the land of ooze. You go, ooh, what is that? Like, oozy stuff? No, that's just how you pronounce it. Land of ooze, okay? And um, so he, he sat here in the land of ooze, where he lived. And we can, when we see that he was one who has chewed evil, he hated evil. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. Now, how many sons did he have? Right, he had seven sons. And that next blank, so these dots are the blanks, three daughters. He had ten kids, man. He was blessed beyond measure. He had seven sons, three daughters. Now you go, oh, that's a lot of kids and a lot of sibling rivalry and fighting. And there may have been that, but you know, every child is a heritage in the Lord. And maybe you don't feel that way for whatever reason, but you are important to God. Every person that has been made has been important to God. That's why he sent his son to die for us. That's why he created us. That's why he provides blessings. And for those who you're like, well, what about the people serving in Africa? He cares about them too. He loves them. And so people are to be cherished, people, especially children. You're to be cherished. And that doesn't mean you walk up to your mom and dad after this lesson and go, Mr. Emerson says I'm supposed to be cherished. That's not what I'm saying. But you are important. So he had seven sons. He had three daughters. Okay, And we see that this man didn't just have a lot of kids. His substance also was 7,000 sheep. So on that last set of blanks, it's going to kind of go across and we'll put... Uh, semicolons in between them, but he had 7,000 sheep. Now you're like, woohoo, lots of cow poo to clean up or sheep poo to clean up. No, 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 no. Back then, this was like having the equivalent of about $7 million. I, I don't know. Of course, I'm throwing some random figures out there. This was their income. This was their money. So equate that to money and pretend that's like $7 million. Okay? And I'm not saying that's the actual equivalent. If you're like, you come back to me or your parents come back to me, well, really, it was this equivalent? Great, let me know. I'm just letting you know he had lots of money. He had 7,000 sheep. He was prosperous. He had 3,000 and 3,000 camels. Oh, look, this guy's like a millionaire compared to all of his other, all the other people. He had 3,000 camels, and camels were worth quite a bit more Actually, sheep were worth quite a bit, and so were camels. Camels for travel. These were for the sacrifices and things that we've talked about earlier this uh, semester. And then oxen. He had 500 yoke of oxen. If you want to be really technical, that's actually two oxen, because a yoke is two uh, coming together. So really, he had 1,000 oxen. This guy, and I know I'm kind of in the way. I'll pop over just a little bit here. Um, but 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen. This guy, as we would say in uh, today's terms, was loaded. Okay, if you're like, what does that mean? He had like an automatic machine gun, dude? No. Uh, what that means is he was rich. He was bountiful. So when someone comes up to you and says, well, rich people, they don't, I heard about the rich man, you know, and wound up in hell, yes. People who are rich typically struggle with faith, struggling, asking Christ in their hearts. And I'm not saying if your family's rich that you haven't received Jesus. What I'm actually pointing out is rich people, God made salvation for everybody. Um, and there are people in the Bible who were kings, who, were, who had money, like Job. And they were prosperous, but they were godly. Okay, And that's the key there. And then we see what kind of man was he? Well, we see that he had 500 yoke of oxen, 500 she-asses, and a very great household. 
so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the east. And his sons went and feasted in their houses every one his day, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And so what we see is the kind of man Job was, was he was, in essence, I'm going to put this up top, and I will try to move out of the way because I know some of you are trying to still get 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen. If you need to pause it, um, I know I'm going a little bit faster than normal, but that'll allow you to pause. Um, but he was the greatest. And we're on page 136 in case you're lost, okay? Um, unless you're still trying to write those numbers down. He was the greatest man of all the East. And that section needs to be a capital E. Hopefully you were writing in pencil, preferably. Um, East, okay. He was blameless and you're going we'll explain that word here in a minute but he was blameless and upright he was a blameless upright or i'm going to write this with proper english and eschewed evil okay this is a really bad b by the way um, so, he was the greatest man of all the East. He was blameless, upright, and his chewed evil. In other words, he was, I mean, he was the top dog in the East. I mean, it, you go out to the, 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 what would be the Middle East, he was the top guy. Everybody knew about him. They knew about his house. They knew about how much money he had. They knew all of these. But they also didn't just know his, you know, his worldly things that he had. And it wasn't worldly, I guess I should use the things of this earth, his earthly possessions, but they knew of his spiritual possessions. He was blameless, meaning when someone would look at him and go, look at my job, I can't blame him. He didn't do anything wrong. He was upright. He was a man that sat here and did what he was supposed to do. He followed God and he is true. He hated every evil. And the key, the, ver the key verse in understanding the character of Job is found in Job one twenty two, And I want, I do, I, I keep going back and forth. I know I'm reading Job, not reading Job, but it's important to see it, especially in these first two chapters, because between chapters 3 to around 38, you see Job getting, basically being a broken and hurt man. But you see what kind of man he was, and he followed Jesus. He followed the Lord, looking toward the cross. And it was so, looking at verse 5, when the days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them, and rose up early in the morning, and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. He did this. He prayed for his kids. He loved his kids. He sacrificed. He did what he was supposed to, looking toward the cross. And then enters in our adversary, who we like to blame. And in this instance, he was to blame. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? God's asking a rhetorical question, but of course Satan always has to pop up and open up his big mouth. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man? That's coming from God, by the way. So not only did people see him, but he had the character of God. God could see he was blameless. He hated evil. He was upright. He followed God. He did what he was supposed to do. And it says, one that feareth God and is cheweth evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, doth Job fear God for naught? Basically, does Job really fear you? 
Because then he continues, Hast not thou made him a hedge about him? Haven't you protected him? And about his house? You've protected his house? You've given him all these things? And about all that he hath on every side, you've given him all of this? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands. He's worked hard. You've given him stuff. Well, it must be easy to bless you, God. This is coming from Satan. And his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thy hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he'll curse thee to thy face. He's basically saying, you know what? Take all of these away. Go ahead, just take it all away, God. Take it all away from Job, and he's going to yell at you. He's going to curse at you. He's going to laugh at you to scorn. He's going to curse you to your face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. That's a God that loves. I care about him. I'm going to allow you to do what you want. But don't you dare touch my servant. And he will, and sorry, continuing on. So when Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. And there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them. And the Sabians fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God has fallen from heaven and hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans came out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. So basically what just happened here is he's lost all of his servants, the people that were under him, his employees. He's sat here and lost all of his money. So all of his money is gone. He just got broke real quick. And while he was yet speaking, there came also another, and more he's losing more of his money. And the Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, and this, he probably was like, okay, he probably had an I don't care attitude, it's money. Good knowing Job. But I guarantee you this hit a little bit more home. And you parents, if you're watching, this does hit a little bit more home. It may be hard for us, and maybe you've got undergone this even if it was just one. But what I'm about to read, and if you're familiar with the story of Job, is probably the most heart-aching part of it all. Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house, and behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness, and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. He didn't just lose his money, folks. He lost his kids. Now, if you're a parent watching, you may have had that. You may have had a, a time in your life where you lost a kid. I have a brother-in-law, and I won't specify names because this is going out on YouTube, who did lose a son and only got to have him for a few days. And that is the toughest thing a parent could do. But imagine you lose 10 kids and those are all of your kids. He lost them all. Then Job arose and rent his mantle, and he ripped his shirt, a sign of grieving, and shaved his head completely and fell down upon the ground and it doesn't say he was yelling what does that say young person and worshiped and said naked came i out of my mother's womb and naked shall i return thither the lord gave and the lord hath taken away blessed be the name of the lord wait he just lost all of his money lost all of his kids praise god what? That doesn't make sense. But yet when we're faced with the trial, how many of us, myself included, have gotten frustrated at the situation that's going on right now? Because it's COVID-19 and it's keeping us home and it's keeping us from our life. You know what? 
He lost everything. He was left with a wife that was not very godly, and we'll see that tomorrow. He was left with himself leaving, living. He lost it all. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Our final blank today, the key verse in understanding the character of Job, is found in 122, which says, in essence, you know, and I want you to write this, not what's in my notes here. And I'm going to I'll write it down here. So now you guys can see that. In all this, Job, send not. Nor charged God foolishly. In all this, Job sin not, nor charge God foolishly. Now, a lot of us may not have made the mistake during this time to charge God foolishly, but how many of us have sinned? How many of us have sat here and got upset with our politicians because we just don't agree with what's going on? How many of us, a young person, have got upset because we don't get to go outside? I had a couple preachers that say, well, you have a right to be upset. No, you, you don't. You have a right to trust in God through it all. Point in my Bible where it says you can be as angry as you want at your situation, and it doesn't say that. Go find the verse, find the chapter, find the book in the Bible that says that. It doesn't. Because in all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. He was a godly man. He did what he should do, what we need to do when we go through trial. Not get upset, not throw our hands in the air, woe is me. The trust in the Lord and understand why he's put us through the trial not demanding why but trusting in the Lord uh, just a couple quick announcements um, make sure if you didn't get any blanks you rewind through and get the blanks um, the idea of this by the way is not fast forward okay uh, kiddo because the idea is this is you need to let God speak to you um, keep in mind um, we only have a couple more class periods uh, and uh, tomorrow we will meet for Bible class. So again, make sure if you didn't have Bibles and Bible books ready, you have them ready for uh, the next class period. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you then. Let's dismiss an order of prayer, and we will let you back to your studies for the day. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for today. Uh, thank you for these children. Uh, thank you for this time in looking at a man of you, Father Job. One who didn't charge you foolishly, didn't sin, but praised you in spite of his circumstances. And Father, I pray and I ask that you be with these children and maybe they're asking the question, why did this have to happen? Comfort their hearts and help them to praise you. Look at the great that they have in their life. Maybe parents are like, I'm so sick of this because I can't be, I need to go to work or I need to do this. Lord, even looking back at Esther for such a time as this. It's a great time for us to remember you. And I just pray and ask that you would strengthen these children as they continue with their studies today. Bless them and have your hand upon them. Strengthen them for your glory. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you guys and have a wonderful day. We'll see you tomorrow.